Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this podcast, Matthew Lee, head of film at the Imperial War Museum, and pianist Stephen Horne discuss films of the home front and their music. My name is Matthew Lee. I'm head of film at the Imperial War Museum. I'm Stephen Horne. I'm a musician, in particular a silent film musician, and I've been accompanying silent films for over 32 years now. We hosted an evening of films at St Andrews as part of the British Home Front Conference. The Imperial War Museum's film collection is one of the oldest in the world. It goes right back to the end of the First World War. It was then that we started receiving material from the Admiralty, from the War Office. This was official material that had normally been shot by camera personnel who were embedded in the Army, the Navy, for example. It was this material that was often used as the war footage for newsreels or short films exhibited in cinemas during the First World War. And we continue to collect material relating to 20th and 21st century conflict. We have material coming to us from the armed forces looking at conflicts in Afghanistan, for example. But it's more than just the combat. There's also a social aspect to the collection in that it gives us an idea of what life was like on the home front. Most people got their news via the cinema. But you're normally dealing with short films, not feature-length films. The programme would be a mixture of different genres, different running lengths. And there were thousands of cinemas during the First World War. Glasgow alone nearly had 100 cinemas, and cinema attendances were millions upon millions. So it was very important for people, particularly the government, to utilise cinema as an arm of their propaganda machine. For example, a newsreel called Topical Budget was taken over in 1917 by the War Office and it became the War Office official topical budget. Of course, these films were silent films, but at the time they would have been screened with musical accompaniment. So there may have been a pianist there, musicians or even an orchestra, depending on the size of the venue. We've worked with Stephen, who's here today, on many different silent films over the years, and it's been a real pleasure to get his insight into the medium. So, Stephen, what does the music and the sound bring to a silent film that we just don't get otherwise? Firstly, I should say that the way I started accompanying silent films was accidental. I started playing for silent films at the BFI, the British Film Institute. I never got to see the films before the public screenings. And in those days, it was almost impossible to get to see them. So I would turn up half an hour before the screening, look at the programme notes, which sometimes were helpful, sometimes weren't, and sit down, seeing it for the first time along with the audience, except that I was channeling my reactions into music, musical interpretation. And that's pretty much the way I did it for about the first 10, 15 years, until gradually with the dawn of the internet, DVDs, it became possible to see films in advance of screenings. The technique that I developed to deal with that challenge, seeing it for the first time along with the audience, firstly, learn how to play by touch and just look at the screen, try and channel what I felt was the filmmaker's intentions. That's a more straightforward process when you're talking about dramas, which is the bulk of what I do, and dramas and comedies and more straightforward fiction films. The work that I've done for you guys at the War Museum presents very particular challenges because they don't fit into typical genres in that way. They can be quite fragmentary. They can be documentary. They can be propaganda. They don't have the typical rhythm and tempo of feature films. Nevertheless, I would say that my process is still the same. I'm trying to channel the film by trying to get inside the intention of the film or the filmmaker, if there was one that can be identified. So when you're channeling the film, how do you decide what instrument you might play at a given moment? Because it's not only the piano you play, is it? Actually, for the first 10, 15 years or so, I did just use the piano. I gradually started to incorporate other instruments. Initially, because I heard another musician doing the same thing, and I thought that it made a very nice change to suddenly hear something other than the piano. My second instrument was always the flute, so I started off with the flute, and then everything else I play is largely keyboard-based, so I play accordion, things like glockenspiels, and anything that incorporates the standard piano 
keyboard and then sometimes percussion. I have a theremin which I occasionally use, but I wouldn't use that for the kind of films that the War Museum gives me to accompany. Choosing other instruments to accompany silent films is largely intuitive. It can be as simple as a change of visual style, if there's some tinting involved. If I feel that there's something that visually creates a different mood or has a different essence, then I'll try and match that with a change of instrument. Sometimes it can be ironic, and sometimes I'm trying to use it for emotive effect. That can be particularly true with the War Museum's material, which often is very emotive. How easy is it for you when you're accompanying this music to avoid the clichés that sometimes can come with this kind of material? When I use my own music, my approach is to try and be neither idiomatic to the period or anachronistic to the period. I try to just create music that's a soundtrack. So it has a kind of timeless appropriateness. Exactly. That's not strictly historically accurate, as we've discovered the work we've done together on the Battle of the Somme and the Battle of the Ankh which has been a real learning experience for everyone, I think. The Battle of the Somme and the Battle of the Ankh were the first two major big battle films of the First World War. They both ran for over an hour and were the first real insight into what combat was actually like at the front. It was important for us to restore those two films and you, Stephen, were instrumental in helping to score this material and get the other musicians together. We had Morton Hutchinson's suggestions where he would list the appropriate sequence and then some music that should accompany it. It gives us a very clear idea of the kinds of music that would have been used in the cinemas at the time. J. Morton Hutchinson, to give him his full name, was well regarded as a writer on specifically music for film. And he was known for his recommendations about how films should be accompanied. And he did this through various articles in the trade press. What were some of the challenges you faced when dealing with these longer format films and some of the musical suggestions that you discovered when you were going through the source material? When your colleague Toby Haggith uh, initially approached me for the score that you were all compiling for The Battle of the Somme, I think it was about 80% in place already by that point. It must have been like 20 years ago now. Toby initially approached me as a hired piano player. He had a screening planned and the original pianist was not available, I believe. So I had to learn this music as a pianist for hire. Then gradually we worked together on filling in the gaps of the score and also changing some of the things that had been put together beforehand, which turned out not to be quite right. Subsequently evolving that into an ensemble arrangement for the DVD. Initially it was very disorientating to play that music because it went against the process that I'd established for myself. It's also music that, to modern ears, is frequently bizarre and sometimes outright inappropriate. Inappropriate in inverted commas, because that's what we consider now. For example, sometimes the music might be quite upbeat, perhaps, yeah. if it was showing images that were quite harrowing or moving, mm. and that might seem almost like a disconnect there. Would that be true? Definitely, yes. The music, in an interesting way, is a mirror of the film, in that I've always felt the film is conflicted. The images are sometimes telling you one thing and then the intertitles will be telling you another thing, almost as though the intertitles are trying to pull your attention away from the content of what you're seeing, like a magician. And the music does the same thing quite often. So you'll be looking at images of the troops going over the top and you'll be hearing an upbeat, jaunty jig or something. But then other times the music will be generally quite moving and emotional. We have now recreated both of J. Morton Hutchison's cue sheets. The first one he compiled was for the Battle of the Somme and then subsequently for the Battle of the Banque. I think that it was his reputation as a writer on music for film that led to him being asked to put this cue sheet together for the Battle of the Somme. His cue sheet was published in the trade press and we know it was used a lot. I think there's record of certain early screenings of the Battle of the Somme where they actually credit his music. I believe in the cue sheet from a regional cinema, they list the pieces that they actually used. And interestingly enough, it's two-thirds the same as the Morton Hutchinson cues. There's too many pieces that are the same for it to be a coincidence because this music is not all obvious music. It's quite rarefied, some of it. 
probably where they diverged from his original suggestions. It was more to do with that ensemble having its own repertoire. They would probably look at his recommendations and say, okay, well, we can do this, we've got that, but we don't really know this and we don't have time to learn it. It's rather difficult. Let's replace it with this substitute piece. And they would have to make the bridges between pieces because the way a cue sheet works in general, from my experiences, the compiler will recommend a piece of music, but it won't be so specific as to say, play this piece of music from bar 25 through to 45, and it will synchronize perfectly with this bit of film. It's more along the lines of when this title comes up, play Beethoven's Overture from the beginning until another title comes up at which point you switch to another film. So that usually means that you're halfway through a musical phrase when the cue to change comes up. I know when I accompanied the Battle of the Somme initially as a soloist, I had to find ways to make those bridges, and that bridge making would be improvisation. Obviously, subsequently, when we did the DVD, we worked out smoother transitions, made it more musical. Mm. The Battle of the Somme and the Battle of Bianc were part of a trilogy which also included The Retreat of the Germans and The Battle of Arras. These films were seen by millions upon millions of people in 1916 and 1917. So that music complement is incredibly important at conveying an emotional message in some cases, as well as a propagandist message. It's very easy to be glib about those films and dismiss them as propaganda. I think it's more complex than that. It's also about morale boosting because you're showing these films to the families of the soldiers who are appearing on the screen. What you often see is the soldiers communicating through the camera operator to cinema audiences back home and potentially family members there. I think one of the lip readers in one of the films we looked at actually said it's for the pictures. So Mm. they knew exactly what they were doing when they're smiling, when they're waving. They're not waving at the cameraman. Exactly. The Battle of the Somme it had its royal premiere in August and it was in cinemas in September and October. It was just only two or three months after the events that it covered. It was shot by Geoffrey Malins and John Benjamin McDowell, who were two officers working with the British Army. They were at the front for just under two weeks. In that time, they secured thousands of feet of material, which was then edited down for the 70-minute film that the audiences were then able to see. But I think we need to remember as well that it was very early in the days of documentary filmmaking. The language and grammar of film were still evolving with these big battle films, the longer format. Traditionally, films would have been 5, 10, 15 minutes in length, so they chapped to the film as they went along. But it's not certainly the way we would look at a film now. The key event in the Battle of the Somme occurs in reel three, the middle of the film. That's the going over the top sequence on the 1st of July. Most people think all that material has been reconstructed, but in the distance you can see soldiers running across a hillside and some men actually fall as they face enemy fire. So they were there and we know they were able to shoot that material as well as to bolster it with material that they perhaps shot behind the lines or in training grounds. Mm. It's a shame, isn't it, that the myth that the film was all recreated behind lines persists. It does to this day and it is probably less than two minutes of entire film of over an hour and ten minutes is reconstructed. So the vast majority is authentic actuality material shot in the locations we believe it to be shot so it's genuine. Now I'd like to talk about three of the films that I screened at the Homefront Conference with Stephen. What we decided to do was look at films that weren't combat films, such as The Western Front or Gallipoli or Salonika, but material that related to what audiences would have seen on the home front and material shot on the home front. One of the films was the work of an army rehabilitation centre in Roehampton, and it illustrates what life was like for soldiers who had come back after the war and had suffered, in some cases, really quite debilitating injuries. This was a 15 minute piece called Repairing Walls Ravages. It was really quite a positive and upbeat film in that it wanted to show that these men had a future and life and they were still able to work even though perhaps they'd lost limbs or they were blind. So it certainly has a propagandist element but at the same time it really was able to convey to audiences that these men could still work as cinema projectionists, as typists or clerks, could do weaving, shape wood. Now, the reality might have been quite different, of course, in the 1920s, some soldiers really did suffer. So we need to look at it through the lens of propaganda, but also to try and understand that things were being done at the time to try and help these men, to give them an opportunity to succeed after 
war's ravages. As you know, the way I accompanied the films at the St Andrews event was essentially my standard way of doing it, which was to improvise my own music, not to reference tunes that people will recognise. My approach has been slightly affected by my work with the compiled scores that I've done for the War Museum, in that I realise now that the intent of the films is probably not what I would have thought 25 years ago. I think there's a danger with musicians who accompany anything to do with the First World War, regardless of the subject, to go into automatic memorial mode, to play music that sounds mournful and music for the fallen. The films of the time that take that kind of approach are very rare indeed. I think my approach is authentic, but it's not authentic in the way of playing music that was written at the time. It's authentic to the extent that I try to be true to the intent of the film and the intent of the person making the film. So, for example, when you're describing that this was quite an upbeat film and try and possibly put a bit of a positive gloss on what was going on, my music would essentially be upbeat and positive. And even if there's an element of propaganda in the film, I wouldn't try to be ironic. I wouldn't try to point that out to the audience. I think you have to respect the audience's intelligence. Another film that I really wanted to bring to the audience at St Andrews is a film called A Day in the Life of a Munitions Worker. The war office at the time was keen to show that there was a huge amount of women working behind the scenes to provide shells and munitions for those fighting at the front. This was shot at Chilwell in 1917. Chilwell was the base of the National Shell Filling Factory in Nottingham, where high explosives were put into shells. So it was actually quite a dangerous job. And only a year later, a major explosion hit the shell factory with a great loss of life. So it's quite possible that some of the munition workers you actually see in the film died or were seriously injured in the explosion. What I find compelling about this film is it uses quite a photogenic central protagonist to tell the story of a day's work effectively from the moment they clock on getting in the train leaving home to all the various stages of the work involved in the factory giving you a real understanding of what they were doing hour by hour it also gives a sense of the camaraderie between the workers there i found it quite beautiful in parts as well working in there of course i imagine would have been horrendous incredibly long hours difficult has anyone ever investigated whether the central lady who appears in the film whether she survived this explosion we don't know and one of the tragedies is i don't think all the people who died in the explosion have been named and that's because of the nature of what happened to them there it was cataclysmic I do remember now accompanying that film. In your introduction, you mentioned the explosion. So the audience had that in their minds when they watched the film. Music, I think, can say more than one thing at a time. You can play the film with the intention that it was made, but also add a little bit of a modern reflective element to it. And I seem to remember playing the film in a positive, upbeat way, but at the last shot, adding a slightly mournful, reflective tone to the music, which was my attempt to loop back to what you'd said about some of the people that you're about to see may not have survived that explosion a year later. The final film that I screened was Memories of Albert and Beyond and Eep the Immortal. This was a film from the mid-1920s, a hand-stenciled film that had colour. A number of films at this time would have either been tinted or toned or a combination of both. There were even colour film stocks around at the time as well. And I thought, if I'm only showing black and white films at this event, it's not giving a true representation of what audiences would have seen at the time. This film is particularly interesting because it looks at early memorialisation on the Western Front. You see some of the early statues, you still see some of the damage there at Albert Cathedral, at Delville Wood, Newfoundland Park. You also see duckboards still there, flooded trenches, some of the detritus of war five or six years after the war took place. At Ypres, you see a souvenir gentleman walking around with a big tray selling memorabilia from the war, early battlefield tourism starting to take shape. I remember when colour appeared on the screen, that's one of the things that would be, for me, an instant cue to change instrument. I think I'd switched to flute at that point, which had a more reflective tone. The film's not necessarily saying that the war was a terrible thing, but it had a reflective, slightly sombre tone. 
I remember leaping on that with great gratitude that I could finally indulge my own <laughs> rather more melancholic views of the war musically. Very recently we've been working with Peter Jackson. We've supplied to him hundreds of hours worth of First World War footage from our collection for him to create a feature-length documentary. He's colourised the material, he's added voices, sound effects, he's made the film 3D, he's tried to create an immersive impression of what it might have been like to have been on the Western Front. That's an incredibly difficult thing to do. He has succeeded. It allows us a deeper insight into the stories of the men. We used over 100 different interviews with soldiers who'd served in the First World War and he allows them to talk at length about their experiences. So it really is a very personal take on the war and the conflict. And for that reason, it offers us something very different. Matthew Lee, head of film at the Imperial War Museum, and pianist Stephen Horn on films of the home front and their music. You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorn and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. In our next and final podcast in the series, we hear from Never Such Innocence, which uses poetry, art and song to engage children and young people across the world with the centenary of the First World War.